Welcome to this film featuring items from the collection of Bodmin Keep, Cornwall's Army Museum in Bodmin, Mid Cornwall. The museum is located in the Keep Building, which is over 160 years old and was the former headquarters of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. Bodmin is one of the oldest towns in Cornwall and at the time of the Doomsday Book in 1086 it was the only market town in the county. The granite moorland of Bodmin Moor lies to the northeast of the town. We have images to show you of souvenirs and mementos, communication, made or carried by soldiers, sport and uniform. There's no rush at all, just pause the film whenever you'd like. Have a chat with your friends and then, when you are ready, just press play again. This film highlights a small part of the collection of Bodmin Keep. If you'd like to find out more about its collection, visit the Bodmin Keep website at www.bodminkeep.org.uk. This pair of intricately painted ostrich eggs dates from the Boer War, 1899 to 1902. They came from a bird native to areas of Africa and Asia. Where possible, local resources would have been used to fulfil the food needs and to supplement the soldiers' rations. These eggs would certainly have been a welcome find for some hungry soldiers. The hand-painted inscription on the left egg reads This ostrich egg is one of 16 found in a nest near our trenches at Zutpan's Drift, Orange Free State, on the 5th of January 1900, being the first men to march into the state since the campaign began. Pro Patria Mori. This egg, after being blown, made a breakfast for eight soldiers with biscuits. The egg on the right, with the hand-painted badge of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, DCLI, was bought from a shop in Ceylon, that's modern-day Sri Lanka, in 1901. The DCLI badge was hand-painted by a sergeant in the regiment. This is a rhinoceros foot, made into what may be either a wine cooler or an umbrella stand. We don't know exactly where it is from or who collected it, but it is likely to have been brought back from South Africa at the time that the Duke of Cornwall's light infantry were there during the late 19th or early 20th century. Big game hunting was popular amongst wealthy European colonists in South Africa and high-ranking officers in the regiments stationed in the area may have also joined in with the sport in their leisure time. It was popular amongst colonists to turn big game prey into hunting trophies to decorate their homes and to remember the exotic animal they had faced. Sometimes, when soldiers were on patrol in new territories, they might encounter dangerous animals and would kill them for their own protection. This little watercolour shows Private George Stallard of the 32nd Cornwall Regiment of Foot and his wife. Stallard was born on the 30th of April 1818 and served with the regiment in Canada 1830 to 1841. He sailed for India on the 30th of May 1846 but sadly died at sea before the ship rounded the Cape of Good Hope. This painting depicts the dress of the time and that it's likely that his wife travelled with him. Here we have a small embossed brass box containing an image of Princess Mary and Christmas cards from Princess Mary and King George and Queen Mary. Inside the boxes were a variety of gifts 
according to which group of people they were being sent to. Smokers were sent tobacco and a pipe. Non-smokers received a packet of acid tablets, paper and pencil. There were also boxes for Indian troops, who received sweets and spices, and nurses were sent chocolate. In October 1914, George V's 17-year-old daughter, Mary Princess Royal, launched an appeal to raise funds so that every member of the armed forces could receive a special Christmas gift, which was this little brass box and contents. Her original intention was to pay for a present for every soldier and sailor from her private allowance, which was impractical, and a proposal was made that she lend her name to a public fund which would raise the money needed to provide the gift. The total money raised was over £163,000, most of this coming from thousands of small donations sent by ordinary people from all parts of the United Kingdom as a mark of respect and gratitude to those fighting in the Great War. By the time the fund was closed in 1920, more than two and a half million boxes had been provided. Many soldiers sent these tins home to loved ones or kept special things inside them. We are looking at a tiny brown bear here. Soldiers would sometimes tuck a lucky charm or keepsake in their pockets when they set off for war, perhaps as a way of remembering times of warmth and love at a time of utter desperation and human destruction. These mascots of home may have been pulled out and admired in the trenches or simply just knowing they were there at the bottom of their pocket may have brought the soldiers some comfort. This pocket bear was carried by an American soldier when he fought in France during the First World War. It was made by the J.K. Farnell Teddy Bear Company, who put the bear's eyes high in their heads so that they could see out of a soldier's pocket. They were also bought by soldiers for their loved ones at home for luck and as an affectionate token to remember them by. Most who enlisted were boys and young men and the majority would never have been away from home. They had little experience of the world, let alone war, so keeping a small object to hold may have helped their mental health and keep them connected to what they were fighting for. Which is your most unusual souvenir and where did it come from? In front of us we have a sizeable piece of the Berlin Wall, which weighs approximately three quarters of a ton. The city of Berlin had been divided between the USSR and Allied countries in 1945. Barbed Wire Sunday is the name given to Sunday morning on August 13th, 1961 when the military and police of East Germany began the construction of what would become the Berlin Wall, with the sole purpose of preventing citizens of East Germany migrating to the West. The Brandenburg Gate border crossing was closed the very next day. The Berlin Wall had officially been established. Berlin went from being the easiest place to make an unauthorised crossing between East and West Germany to being the most difficult. The Berlin Wall was a 96-mile-long, heavily guarded, concrete block double wall, imposing a physical barrier to divide Berlin politically and ideologically. It was the physical embodiment of the Iron Curtain, that separated the Eastern Bloc and Western Europe during the Cold War. This piece of the Berlin Wall was collected by a Cornishman, Major John Dudart Aberdeen, in November 1989. 
John recalls how he tasked a group of soldiers trained and equipped as assault pioneers, that is, demolition and explosive specialists, to demolish and recover some of the wall as mementos. He told them to be sure to recover the fragments from a discreet area of the wall, expecting them to bring back some football-sized pieces. However, they also produced a very large slab of graffiti-covered wall, complete with reinforcing bars. Do you remember the wall going up in 1961, or the dramatic scenes of people sitting on top of it when it was taken down in 1989? This hand-engraved brass vase was made from an artillery shell during the First World War and is over 100 years old. It is decorated with a French and Union flag and the name of the officer who probably bought it, called Lieutenant Corporal Birch, and his regiment in the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. Decorated shell cases are the most common type of trench art. Designs could be taken from a stencil and transferred to the shell case using iodine. A bent nail was then used to engrave the design into the metal. Soldiers, prisoners of war who made things to pass the time or to trade, and civilians all made trench art. It was a portable way for soldiers to entertain themselves. Soldiers also took home souvenirs from their time abroad to remember where they had been and the people they'd met, in the same way that people do today when they visit new places. They would also send souvenirs to family and friends to assure them that they were safe and enjoying themselves. A vase like this one became a precious object within a family. This is a miniature of an officer of the Grenadier Company circa 1827 and was painted by J.T. Mitchell. Usually painted for the sitter's loved ones, miniatures of soldiers were treasured personal mementos. They were often commissioned as gifts for parents or wives when an officer was sent abroad, sometimes for many years without leave to return home. Some miniatures were held in decorative gold and enamel frames with elaborate plaits and curls of hair set into their backs. This metal bracelet belonged to Teresa Ridge, whose father, Edward, served with the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. It shows Teresa's name identity number and address. Bracelets such as this were given to children who were living in areas at high risk of being bombed and who were not evacuated. They would make it easier for a child to be reunited with their parents or next of kin if separated after an air raid or worse, identified if killed. Children would be encouraged to learn the information on their identity card or bracelet off by heart in case it was lost during an air raid. This box is for personal possessions, including writing paper, ink, pens and personal papers such as letters. It belonged to Colonel Shaw of the 46th Regiment. The boxes were a lockable container in which a sailor kept his most prized or unusual possessions, as well as personal items needed on an everyday basis. They were typically used to hold small personal items, such as a brush and comb, shaving set, needles and thread, or letters and photographs from home. Special tools could also be stored in the boxes. People don't seem to keep their correspondence in such an ornate box these days, do they? Most of us keep a few very special letters, though, and young people probably save their favourite text messages on their phones, I expect. 
Nowadays, sometimes letters or parcels go adrift, don't they? It seems amazing that letters and parcels reached soldiers at the battlefront, in the trenches and elsewhere abroad. How logistically brilliant! This leaflet, appealing for Cornish men to join the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, was created in August 1914, at the start of the First World War, when three new battalions of the DCLI were formed. It gives details of the roles available in the regiment and their potential earnings. For example, a quartermaster who supervised stores and distributed supplies could make nine shillings a day, just under £20 in today's money, with housing allowance and pension. The leaflet promises excellent career opportunities for Cornish men who would be made doubly welcome and would have every inducement to be promoted. So great was the response, not only from Cornish men, but from all over Britain, that the regimental depot at Bodmin was totally overwhelmed by the number. The barracks, which would usually have held no more than 200 men, suddenly found itself having to look after 10 times that number without any additional resources. With remarkable efficiency, within days, embryo Kitchener battalions were set up across the south of England, to which these volunteer recruits were dispatched. The 6th Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel T. R. Stokoe, mentioned in the leaflet and shown in our slide here, was established at Watts Common near Aldershot. It is astonishing with hindsight to think that parents who wanted a really good and comfortable career for their sons were asked to sign them up to the army on the outbreak of war even one which was expected to be over by Christmas. The leaflet asks parents to contact Major Stokoe, who at the time was the officer commanding the Bodmin Depot. This handwritten letter from Florence Nightingale was written by her to the relative of an injured soldier when she was at Scutari Hospital during the Crimean War of the 1850s. The reason it's in the museum's collection is that the 46th Regiment of Foot she refers to in the letter is one of the ancestral regiments of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. The letter reads as follows. Barrack Hospital, Scutari, April the 30th, 55. Madam, I am exceedingly happy to be able to inform you that on the 29th of last month, Alfred Phillips of the 46th Regiment was alive with his regiment in the Crimea, since when we have no account of him. I hope, therefore, that your information is mistaken, as he was certainly alive when it was dated. I would recommend you to write to him at his regiment in the Crimea. Believe me, yours truly, Florence Nightingale. P.S. I will write to the adjutant of his regiment and ask for all information concerning him and forward it to you next post, as I am going up to the Crimea myself this week. And it finishes with the lady's name and address. Best known for her care of soldiers during the Crimean War and for pioneering modern medicine, Florence Nightingale pushed to raise the standards of nursing with the establishment of her nursing school in London in 1860. Her social reforms included improving health care for all sections of British society and expanding the acceptable forms of female participation in the workforce. This quilt was made by a soldier of the 32nd Regiment of Foot during the Siege of Lucknow, India, in 1857. We do not know this man's name or why he made the quilt, 
but it may have been a form of therapy to cope with the trauma of the siege. This quilt was made from the uniforms of fallen soldiers. The red and white fabric was taken from the jackets, while blue fabric was taken from the trousers. The green fabric came from a billiards table that was destroyed during the siege. The six-pointed star in the centre is surrounded by four embroidered letters, WSSJ, though we do not know what they stand for. The Lucknow quilt, as it is known, would have been used as a tablecloth or wall hanging. This ornate late 19th century pincushion was made by a recovering soldier serving abroad with the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry as a form of craft therapy. In the early 1900s, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, or shell shock as it was known, was not well understood. Those with PTSD were often accused of being cowards. This traditional view of mental health was difficult to shake, but our pincushion is an early example of changing attitudes. Recovering soldiers were provided with several craft materials and encouraged to take part in embroidery, beadwork, woodwork and in creating pincushions. The pincushion creating kits contained pins, beads, ribbons and a representation of the soldier's regiment. These artistic tasks were a good distraction from war. They offered a way to channel trauma by providing a focus. Pincushions were personal creations and many soldiers stitched messages onto them. Our soldier chose the words, Think of me suggesting that this cushion was going to be sent home to a sweetheart, wife, mother or family member as a token of love and memory. Some soldiers chose to include photographs of themselves or their loved ones. Our soldier included a picture of his regiment, the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. This picture is a traditional and idealised depiction of the regiment, far from the reality of war. Soldiers in the First World War wore khaki uniforms and not red coats like the men in the picture. So why did the soldier choose this representation of his regiment? The original picture comes from a postcard and it is likely that it was provided to the soldier in the pincushion creating kit. Perhaps our soldier did not have his own photographs or did not want to part with them. Perhaps seeing the powerful depiction of his regiment was a source of pride. Another interesting feature are the anchor elements made from pins on either side of the picture. Did this soldier have naval ties, I wonder? This is an embroidered belt made by Sergeant J. A. Grenfell from the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry while in hospital. Hospitals tending the wounded of the First World War provided bright, clean, quiet environments where traumatised and injured soldiers could carry out calm, meditative work. This was essential to their rehabilitation from mental and physical wounds. One of the activities was embroidery, also known as fancy work. Regimental badges were a popular subject. Sergeant Grenfell served with the 10th Battalion DCLI, who were an infantry pioneer battalion. Men in this battalion provided the heavy manual labour in the forward areas which was vital to the success of every battle on the Western Front during the First World War. Sergeant Grenfell was wounded on the 5th of August 1916 during the Battle of the Somme while his battalion was digging trenches in the Guillemont area under heavy artillery fire. He was subsequently awarded the Military Medal for his actions on that day. 
Sergeant Grenfell is seen on the left of the photograph in a hospital bed with his army cap on top of the bedclothes. Which of these objects made by soldiers or carried by soldiers has surprised you the most? Which is your favourite and why? Have a chat with your pals and see if your choice is the same or different from theirs. Best known for being the manager of the World Cup winning England 1966 team, Alf or Alfred Ramsey started out as an amateur footballer, serving in the 1st Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry from 1943. He signed as a professional player with Southampton while stationed there with the DCLI. Alf remained a professional footballer until 1955, playing for Southampton and then Tottenham Hotspur. Many professional footballers served in the armed forces as players were called up or drafted into war work. Alf was a talented footballer with a strong battalion team around him. The team was seldom beaten by other regimental sides during his time in it. Football was encouraged to keep troops fit, active and entertained. It was an important form of recreation and helped raise money for service charities. Alf also played for England, winning 31 caps, three of them as captain. In 1955, he became manager of Ipswich Town, a post he held until 1962 when he was appointed manager of the England team. Do you remember where you were or what you were doing when England won the World Cup in 1966? I remember I was busy troweling on thick black eyeliner to my eyelids and backcombing my hair like the pop stars Dusty Springfield and Helen Shapiro. Joe Lewis was an American professional boxer who competed from 1934 to 1951. Lewis reigned as the world heavyweight champion from 1937 until his temporary retirement in 1949. This photo from 1944 shows Joe Lewis crouched down talking to troops at Bodmin Barracks. Lewis did not see combat and was later employed to bolster troop morale ahead of the D-Day landings. He fought in over 90 exhibition matches, including Bodmin, before over 2 million troops. The photograph was taken by Bodmin-based photographer George Ellis. Ellis moved to Cornwall from London at the outbreak of the Second World War. A professional press photographer, George documented news stories and community events from 1939 until the late 1970s. Physical fitness has always been essential for soldiers. The British Army considered physical strength, endurance and coordination absolutely vital for fighting troops. New recruits had to be brought up to the Army's standard of fitness. Trained soldiers then had to maintain their fitness as well as learn specialised skills. It was believed that physical training built character and developed both self-confidence and a better fighting spirit. How do you feel about sport and exercise? Personally, I'm not a great fan. Put it this way, my all-time best at the high jump was 2 foot 4 or 70 centimetres as a teenager, after which I bowed out gracefully. The Cornwall Yeomanry Cavalry was raised in Launceston in 1797. The miniature portrait is of Joseph Hoskin James, who was an officer of the 2nd Cornwall Yeomanry Cavalry in 1822. The headdress was designed by Colonel Tarleton, 
who commanded a corps of cavalry and light infantry soldiers during the American War of Independence. It is said by the National Army Museum to have been regarded as the handsomest of helmets and was reportedly admired by foreign forces at the time. Can you pick out the detail in the badge and Cornwall Yeomanry title above the peak? I wonder, have you ever worn elaborate headwear for a special occasion? What did it look like and how did you feel wearing it? The stock was a high neck collar designed to improve military bearing and appearance by forcing the chin high and posture straight. Due to its resistance to soiling and simplicity to put on, it was considered suitable neckwear for soldiers. However, the neck stock dug into the chin and neck with no material layer underneath, making them extremely uncomfortable. The British Army reverted to black leather ankle boots for non-commissioned personnel after the First World War. Constructed of leather with the smooth side outermost, from the 1930s they were fitted with protective toe caps of similar style to those used by early munitions workers, which may account for the reason why this style of boot became known as ammunition boots. The soles, however, were studded. Initially with 25 studs per boot, this number was reduced from April 1945 to 15. As a further measure of economy, by August of the same year, the number of studs per sole was reduced to 13. This pattern of coat was introduced for wear by the infantry in 1829. It was worn as a dress jacket rather than a combat jacket. It continued in use until 1855, during a long period of peace in Europe, when sartorial splendour was considered of greater importance than utility. The design was intended to cut out the extraordinary excesses of costly flamboyance which had been introduced when peace was signed after Waterloo. Which of these items would you find the least uncomfortable to wear, do you suppose? This is the end of our film. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed making it. Remember to check the video notes below this film for access to our museum website at www.bodminkeep.org.uk together with links to the 3D tour of Bodmin Keep, the museum's War Stories podcast series and our YouTube channel. You'll also find the Hereth link to access more wonderful films in this similar style. A cheer for the lads from a Cornwall, once more for her tawny stones. When bugles call in line, they fall and march to the roll of the drums. They forward go to face the foe, all danger they will dare. Mid flashing steel of the battlefield, Cornwalls will be there. Then here's a cheer for the Western lads, the brave East allies. With flags unfurled, they face the world. Oh, true Trelawney boys, no faltering they but through the fray they storm or day.